We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way to get questions in is to go through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. And our question list is getting shorter after every week. We haven't gotten any new questions for a while. So we would love to see some new questions rolling in anytime. Today, we have a question from Samantha Bryant, who asks, What are some of your favorite games when you've got a mixed crowd of mundanes and gamers? I'm looking for things that are simple enough that they won't overwhelm noobs, but interesting enough to engage gamers in the same group. Well, thanks for the question, Samantha. So first off, quick note, I do prefer the terms gamers and non-gamers to using terms like noobs and mundanes when talking about people who are either new to the hobby or just haven't discovered the joy of hobby board gaming. Now, I get it that there, it's a thing, right? Like the whole muggles and Harry Potter and mundanes and Scott and so on. But I personally worry people are going to find these terms somewhat demeaning, and that's not something we want to make a new gamer feel. And let's be clear, muggles is a demeaning term in Harry Potter. It's uh, generally said either thoughtlessly or with negative emphasis. And its root, as told by uh, Rowlings herself, is a British term, mug, for someone who is easily fooled. So, But getting past the terminology, we get it. What do we want from a game that's going to be good for new and old gamers alike? Now, we've talked about gateway games many, many times on the show. Uh, for good gateway games, what we want to do is find something that's accessible, something that isn't overwhelming or intimidating, something that's easy to teach and that doesn't have too many different mechanics. So there's generally a focus on one or two core mechanics. And then we also want something, we probably want something relatively short. You don't want to tie someone down for an epic game when they're not that experienced with board games in general. And one thing that might shift your thinking, depending on your friend group, is the kind of non-gamers you have. Some people are non-gamers because they don't or haven't played, not because they can't or aren't interested. Mm -hmm. That one friend who does the New York Times crossword puzzle in pen over a cup of coffee on Sunday mornings <laughs> may have never played Power Grid, but they still might kick your butt doing it. <laughs> Very true. I don't have Power Grid on my list today. To me, that, that's a little more advanced than I expected from the average non-gamer, but very true. So while you've got approachable, easy to teach and learn games and quick games are great for new gamers, based on Sam Antha's question, we also have to worry about keeping the experienced gamers at the table interested. So now we want to find a game that not only has those other qualities, but we want something with some weight and engagement. We want games where strategy and tactics matter, and we want a game with meaningful decisions. Basically, we want everything. Give us it all. <laughs> Detail, ease, complexity, straightforwardness, great for young and old. Now we're going to try to get to these are probably the most generic game suggestions out there because of this, because they're going to appeal to the widest audience. And thankfully, there are a number of games out there that fit all of these criteria. Now, these are going to be my suggestions for great games that appeal to both new gamers and experienced gamers alike playing together at the same table. So first up, Monopoly. No, I'm just kidding. I no. will not do that no. to you. Uh, <laughs> first no. up, Imhotep, Builder of Egypt. All right. Since getting Imhotep, I have played this with a wide variety of players at different skill levels, and everyone so far has enjoyed playing it, uh, from the experienced gamers to the brand new players. And I have literally seen both at one event, at the Easy Mode events we've had. Uh, now, Imhotep has an added bonus over many of these games of having a second side to each of the player boards in the game. Now, these B sides are actually a bit more complicated and allow more tactical and strategic play, and thus will more appeal to the, the hardcore gamers, the experienced gamers. So what I recommend is start off with a group of mixed gamers. You're going to use just the A side in one game. Now, this game's short, like half an hour short. You're probably going to have time to play multiple games. So you play that first game on the A side, and the next game, throw a couple of those B sides in, and that'll keep the interest of the more experienced gamers. Yeah, and you know what? I see a lot of buzz on Amatep right now uh, on, uh, on board game Twitter. Uh, people are still seemingly discovering it, mm. and it is it is constantly coming up, and it is undeniably loved by every mm -hmm. person who mentions it on board game Twitter. It's it's really impressive to see that. And, and it's it, not a new game at this point. No, it's not. And, and yet it seems to just have, have gone under the radar just enough that uh, it's picking up steam now, but better late than never, I guess. And that was Imhotep, 
builder of Egypt. Uh, next up, a perennial favorite, Carcassonne. Now, of all of the classic gateway games, games that have been around for years, like more than 20 years, Carcassonne remains one of my strongest suggestions. It's probably the oldest game that's in this list. There might be another one that's close. I'm not sure which came first. I'll recommend this one over Catan or Ticket to Ride for classic games. The actual rules of Carcassonne are pretty simple. Place a tile, then decide if you want to put a meeple on that tile or not. That's pretty much it. It's the actual scoring that can be a bit difficult to grasp, especially the farm scoring for new players. But it's something players pick up after repeated plays. Now, what I love about Carcassonne is that there's a lot more to the game than it first appears. And I found it's one of those games where players have eureka moments, where you're playing, they're playing Carcassonne, and then just all of a sudden something clicks, right? And they suddenly realize, oh, wait, I can steal cities from another player. Or they sit there and go, wait a minute, I've played this a few times. There's only like six cloisters in that entire bag, and four of them are out already. And they start doing the math. They're realizing there's only one tile that has a city on all four sides, stuff like that. And then once they have those moments, they adjust their strategies and the gameplay evolves and actually gets better from then on. Yeah, and as well as that, not only that, but also the number of players changes that game quite dramatically. So if four people are playing at one time and, and three people sit down and play it the next time, it's going to be a different game yep. again because that math changes with the number of players every mm -hmm. time. Uh, and then, of course, you get all the various uh, additions that can come in there uh for better or worse in some cases uh and uh and, and and you know either amp it up or uh extend it or uh just you know give it that next little level of of something where not everyone might have to to worry about it but it gives it that extra weight for the the more experienced gamers and that was carcassonne now next up i think everyone knew this was coming to the list eventually <laughs> azul yeah, no longer my number one recommendation, though. I, I, at, for a while there, if, if I had written this before playing Azul, it would have been the one on the top of the list. No, this list isn't in any particular order. It's just the order they came to my mind as I was writing up today's show notes. Um, Azul, for a long time, was my number one recommendation for a game that appeals to all gamers. Like, it's a great abstract strategy game that has appealed to pretty much everyone I've, I've taught to, new and experienced alike. I've yet to find anyone that hates this game Though I am now starting to run into, at least locally, quite a few players are getting a little sick of it because Azul was out at every event and everyone was playing it. Now, if you've got a non-gamer that likes tile laying games like Scrabble or anything else where you're trying to build patterns of tiles, they're going to dig this game. It's a great next step game, and there's more than enough depth here to keep an experienced gamer happy. I still strongly recommend Azul. It just locally we played it a lot, and I gotta say, Emotep's just a little neater. There's a little more going on, and it's still got that nice tactile feel. So I actually now recommend Emotep over Azul for a new group, but both are still great games. Yeah, no, I think Azul is fantastic, and again, we want to stress that this is uh, the original Azul, not Azul Stained Glass at yes. Sintra, which I would not recommend for nope. uh, non gamers at all. That's nope, that would I that would not that confuses them in a hurry. Um, but Azul, absolutely, it, it's a really easily accessible game um not necessarily accessible in a ryan method because i know there are some tile problems and things that make make uh, it, it a little difficult if you don't uh hack i believe uh, yeah i don't know if i don't think you can feel the texture on the tiles yeah. in that way Sintra might be better but the the gameplay of Sintra, like Sintra is a great next step if you have a bunch of experienced gamers with a bunch of new gamers who are becoming experienced gamers, and you get tired of Azul, Sintra is an interesting way to mix it up. But I also don't recommend it as an introduction game. No. So that was Azul. And next up, we have the king or queen, Domino. All right, with a mixed group, including new gamers, start with King Domino. It's, it's dead simple. Uh, it, it's a very solid game. Experienced gamers are probably going to like it. There's going to be enough in there to keep them interested for a round or two. But experienced gamers are probably going to want something a little more. And that's when you break out Queen Domino. After everyone's got a good handle on King Domino, Queen Domino is much more of a gamer's game. Um, it adds in variability through building tiles. And there's a resource management aspect where you require players to spend and earn money through taxes during the game. Queen Domino also adds in a bit of take that mechanic with the dragon that experienced gamers should enjoy. Now, I do admit I'm basically telling you to buy two games. So that is the disadvantage here. Now, you could play Queen Domino and skip the building rules, but it's not recommended. Um, I wish they put out a copy where you just got both together. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like the way they're trying to market it. But if you're just going to get one, I do recommend King Domino. But like I said, your experienced gamers are probably going to have fun for three, four, or five rounds. 
if it's a one game night thing, it's probably great. But if you're going to keep bringing it out, you might want to step up to the other edition. Yeah, I really enjoy all my plays of King Domino. It's a fun game, but I haven't played it that many times. Uh, and I can definitely see how if it was if it got to be too regular, you mm-hmm. can sort of be like, oh, this again? Really? OK. Yeah. Uh, and so I and for that, I am looking forward to seeing Queen Domino. Hopefully they'll get the Queen Domino onto or sorry, King Domino Marina on, yeah. onto uh, Board Game Arena. So that was that was uh, King and Queen Domino. And next up, we have Gizmos. All right. Uh, Gizmos are really any other gateway engine building game. So there's a series of these that have come out in probably the last five years. I don't know when Splendor came out, but Splendor, Century Spice Road, Century Golem Edition is kind of the progression. Splendor was the great game. Everyone was talking about it. Then Spice Road came out and everyone's like, oh my God, it's better than Splendor. Then the Golem Edition came out and people are like, that's better than Spice Road. Of all those games, personally, I really like Gizmos. Something about that little the marble feeder I like more. That's the reason I listed Gizmos on this list. Personally, it's my favorite. But all of these games are great intro-level tableau building, engine building games that are easy enough to learn that even non-gamers can enjoy them. And there's just something about an engine builder as a style of game, something about where you start off with pretty much nothing and end up with a hopefully well-oiled point-making machine at the end of the game that is just rich, really rewarding. Like, I love engine builders in all types of games. And these are some great gateway ones. It's just that feeling of accomplishment that I built this thing out of these cards and I did it and I have this thing and it works. That feels so good. That's why I put this on the list. And well, again, a lot of these games do the same sort of thing. One of the major benefits about of Gizmos that we've talked about many times is really how it displays. You know, it's it's hard to debate the fact that this game looks cool, looks fun and attracts attention and gets people interested in the concept of the game just by the very marbly, towery concept yeah. of the setup. Um, and, and makes that that intro less painful because, yes, it's it, it it's not the easiest game in the world, but it's fun because it's marble. So, sure, show me, what, show me how to do this. You know. Plus, I find people dig the theme of the whole science fair, building a Rube yeah. Goldberg machine at a science fair that's very accessible to people. Versus Century Golem Edition, what are you doing trading power cars in an Asian bazaar to power up your golem car? I don't know. So that was Gizmos, and next up we have Chocolatiers. All right, I have found the theme of building a sampler box of chocolates is a pretty dang easy sell to gamers of all experience levels. This is one of the games where whenever I've been playing it at events, which has only happened recently, we have people come up and get into like, what is that? Are you building chocolates? Are those real chocolates? Which is part of the presentation. They're glossy. And yes, man, you should have a box of, um, or a C-cord or, I don't, I don't know what the blocks of chocolates in the U.S. would be, but the, you should have those while playing this game because it's going to make you hungry. Um, people are just drawn to this game because of the theme. Now, this is another game that I think like Carcassonne has some great eureka moments in it. Everyone I teach this game to comments, like partway through, they start going like, oh, and then they're like, oh, wait, there's a lot more going on here than it first appears. Because you can just play the game trying to make your little nice box of chocolates for yourself, but the game really starts to shine when you realize it's even more about watching what the other players are doing with their candies and adjusting your strategy based on what everyone else is doing. But you can just do your own thing and still be able to play the game effectively, which is why I think this one would be so great for a table of mixed gamer experience levels. Yeah, and I actually don't think the Chocolate Series is a great gamer game, but for this kind of mixed gaming... I think it is great. Uh, one of the big problems with Chocolatiers that a lot of people uh, talk about is that the it's not a really great strategy game. There's a lot of ramness is in there. There are some complaints about some certain uh, rule aspects of it, and I think this could this can wear quickly on a, a group of hardcore gamers. But when you get that mixed group in mm-hmm. there, is where it really is going to shine. I think that's sort of like the 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 ideal placement for this type of game. That and as Ryan is mentioning in the chat room. Why is there not a real chocolate version? No, there of really this? should. I mean, like, like they make chocolate Catan. Why is there not a chocolate chocolatiers? <laughs> so I, 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 we should make one. Like, yeah. like you, you, we'd have to go to like Purdy's Chocolates and yeah. like get a list of the six different chocolate types and how many you would need yeah. to do it. But yeah, there definitely should be a, a legacy version of chocolatiers. <laughs> Absolutely. So that was chocolatiers, and next up we have Sagrada. 
Yeah, this one's come up a lot, it seems, recently. This I, I think I'm liking Sagrada more and more the more it comes out. Uh, it's a dice-drafting, stained-glass, window-building game that's both elegant and beautiful. Uh, each turn, you're going to pick two dice and put them on your player board. That's pretty much it, right? But you got to make sure that dice touching each other don't have the same color or the same numbers. And i got to say, that is way harder to do than it sounds. Um, then you add in these tools that are randomized every game that let you break the rules. And then a variety of different player cards, so different windows that you're aiming for. And you have a great game for various difficulty levels. The one that I really like in this game for new players versus experienced players is you get windows, you draft windows at the beginning, and they have difficulties on them. And for a new player, you just recommend they take the easier windows. Now, by taking the easier windows, their pattern's easier to make, but they get less tools to use. But in a way, that's good for a new player because they shouldn't need the tools because their window's easier. Whereas an experienced player can take that difficult six-star card that's going to be really hard to place their tiles and be challenged and be able to compete with the easier player. And I think it's really neat that way that can work in that game. And the rules are simple enough that, yes, a new player could also start with a six window and potentially win. But it's that option of, hey, if you're having a hard time with this game, pick a really easy window to start. And then you don't have to worry about the tools as much as everyone else. I really dig that. Yeah, no, Sagrada has come a long way. And again, if you're worried about group size, they do have a five and six player uh, expansion that came out mm -hmm. last year. Uh, and this game is a uh, wonderfully Canadian game that has really uh, been showing some staying power, uh, power, and it's really well liked. Um, you know, there's not really too many people have negative things about this unless they're the haters. Um, <laughs> Which they're always going to. It's too it's, random. There's, always, there's yeah. dice. There's, there's always stack. there's always going to be haters. But I, I have to say this this game has a really nice balance of of both in likability and weight. Uh, and I still have never actually played it. One of these times. That's that's another Sometimes. one. At some point, I told you you need an Excel file or something. I know, I know. Um, and so that was so, Sagrada. Yeah. And next up, we have Takedo. As is one, Sean and I have played a lot lately. Uh, what I find really cool about Takaido is this is a game that plays completely different with a group of new players than it does with a group of experienced players. Like, literally, completely, almost like you're playing two different games. Yet it works brilliantly with a mix of both, because both types of play are valid. New players tend to focus on the journey and the story and making sure they eat, making sure they see all the vistas. Whereas experienced players are all about making sure the other players don't get that thing they need, making sure they don't get that final vista or they don't get to go to the shop or they don't get to go work on the farm because they're going to need money by the last thing. It's a two, two very different styles of play. The game can be either totally zen or completely cutthroat, and it's just as fun played both ways. Absolutely. I mean, I play this game almost too much. Uh, I, <laughs> basically, I, I, a game every day and a half or so I, I play. Um depending on how all our schedules line up. Yeah. And the one thing that's really nice about this now, especially when you're adding crossroads, and, and again, I, I don't think you should be playing without crossroads, um, but when you add in crossroads, you add so many possibilities. And then if you get in there with the sweet spot of three players, you have so many options to play, and they're almost all valid, potentially winning combinations. Right. Uh, and so... You can explore. And so what I do, because again, because I play it so often now, I'm, hey, I don't know if I've ever played with this particular character or I haven't played with this character in a long time. And the last time I did it this way and it, it didn't go so well, what happens if I do it this way? And you play through and, you know, maybe you get crushed and you get a, you know, 40 or you crush everybody else and you get an 88, you know, and it, <laughs> you're just not sure. And that's, that's one of the great things about it. So that a non-gamer can sit and enjoy and figure things out Whereas a gamer can find additional uh, interest and challenge mm -hmm. in the game just by trying something different. I don't know if I'd recommend Crossroads for the first play with a okay. new player. This, I, I think you need to learn what those board spaces do before you give people an option. Uh, see, I, I found it frustrating that there was no option when I was in those yeah. early games. Uh, that, that it was, you know, oh, you're just, you're stuck. I, I don't want yeah, to do you're this. Stuck. This, is no, this is useless to me. Why do I want this? Yeah. Um, so that was Takedo, and next up we have Bing, yes. aka Bonanza. Bonanza. Uh, this is another tried and true classic. This is one I couldn't remember if it's older or not from Carcassonne. It's up there. They're around the same time period, just before the turn of the century, which always seems so weird to say, but it's true. <laughs> uh, one of the great things about Bonanza is that every player 
is engaged every round. Because even if you don't have the bean or want the beans that are up for bid during a round, you should be paying attention to what the other people are offering or wanting so that you can better negotiate on your turn. This is also a great game for higher player counts, right? You can play up to seven. It might be eight. I think it's seven people at once in this game. It caters just as well to new players because it's simple to teach. Play the first card in your hand, possibly play the second card, put two games out for bid, beans out for bid. You have to plant everything by the end of your turn. That's pretty much it. Uh, this has been a staple at any public play event I've run just because it works so well with players of different experience levels and for larger groups. I can't, like, I. this was just in my kit. Everywhere I went, I had bananas on the box for a long time. And it sat on the shelf for a bit, I'll admit. And then we brought it out for my birthday this year in January, and since then, it's been coming back out again. No, I have to say, Bonanza is one of those great games where you you can you can play it or you can not play it and just be there at the table throwing yeah. some cards around. Uh, and, and it's a lot of enjoyment. Uh, the, only, the only thing you have to watch out for is that I think it's sometimes... The, if you have too many non-players, it can sort of take away the fun of the of the players who are trying to actually, you know, get too involved. Yeah. Um, so that you've, you've got that potential you can wa to watch out for. But really, it's just, I mean, it's a fun, silly game. So even the, the gamers are probably going to be having some fun and laughing it up during this one. It's just enjoyable. Yeah, it's odd that trading beans and talking about trading beans tends to devolve into laughter. Well, and I, I'm not quite sure why. It's like, the restriction. The it's it's the hand restriction because you're never worrying about sorting your hand. You're sorting your cards or or or, or yeah. trying to find the best balance. You're stuck with what you've got in that order, and that gives you a freedom to chat and enjoy and, and, yeah, and do whatever yes. because there's nothing else you can do. You can't nothing with that hand you can do except for what's coming Trade. up next. Yeah. Yep. Um. And so that is Bonanza, B-O-H-N-A-N-Z-A. -A. Next up, Lanterns, the Harvest Festival. I love watching this game blow people's minds. Because in Lanterns, when you play a tile, not only do you get something out of it, but so does every other player. And that, new players are always like, what? Like, it, it really tends to shock people. Now, the secret to playing well is being sure you don't help someone else more than you help yourself on your turn. It's this aspect that keeps will keep the heavier gamers interested. That whole trying to optimize every play so that you're getting more out of it than anyone else. Even though the basic mechanics are pretty simple, it's a pretty dead simple game. It's play a tile, get some lanterns, and trade in sets of lanterns for points. You're going to keep coming back to this one just because of that neat interaction of when I play it, I'm not only helping me, I'm helping everyone else. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, the Emperor's Gift, is that a, is that a benefit? I personally found that to be one of those bloated expansions that made a tight game too loose and too open. I haven't played with Emperor's Gifts since the first time trying it. Okay. Well, there we go. So we'll, we'll, we'll take that one off the list. Yeah. And, um, I, was, I was not a fan of what Emperor's Gifts added to the game. All right. Uh, and so that was Lantern's The Harvest Festival. And next up we have Endeavor, Age of Sail. All right. Now, in this case, you got to worry about the intimidation factor. So hide the box before people see it and all the extra exploit components, right? That's a, that's a variant of play that was added with the Age of Sail version. Or if you have it, just bring out the original Endeavor, not the Age of Sail edition. That would work. So if you're going to show a new gamer, hide all that stuff the first time. Because all those bits and bobs can be really intimidating. It looks like there's a ton of stuff in the box. But the basic game, the original Endeavor, is a very straightforward game. Every player is going to add a building to their town each round. You start with one, you're going to get with more. The buildings are what determine what actions you can take. So at the start of the game, you're only going to have, in general, one choice the first round because you've only got one building. And then it's going to slowly grow as the game goes on, giving you more options, which is great because you have a nice tight focus and you don't have to learn all the things right from the start, which is very different from a game we're going to talk about way later in the episode today. But I love just how smooth, quick, and simple Endeavor is. It gets all that feel of an epic, uh, I would say 4X. Yeah, it's a 4X. You're doing all the 4Xs. But in Age of Sail times, you're getting that feel of an epic game in like an hour. It is so fantastic. Just take all the exploit stuff, which there's a ton of exploit stuff. Hide that away for a couple months, couple weeks, till everyone's got more experience, then maybe break it back out. Yeah, this is definitely one of those ones where you've got to sort of 
judge your crowd carefully. If they're a bunch of real lightweights, that this might terrify them away from the table. Yeah, um, though but, it's not as bad as it looks. No, it's, just, it's, it's not, an intimidation factor. Absolutely. That's, Seeing this game is, yes. you know, where Gizmos is going to draw people in because it looks neat. This is uh-huh. going to make people go, I'm going to go have another coffee. <laughs> to be honest, I find Gizmos easier to teach than Endeavor. Yeah. Like, it just, Gizmos is a more complicated game with more interactions than Endeavor is. Right. But it looks much simpler. Right. So that was Endeavor, Age of Sail. Next up, Ingenios. All right, swapping to not at all intimidating looking games. Uh, this is a deceptively simple abstract game. Uh, it's one of my favorite games to put it into tournaments, which just shows how tactical and strategic it can be. This is another game where you can just play perfectly fine after a quick teach. It's it's almost Scrabble-like. You get a bunch of tiles, you put a tile on the board, you score based on what how your tiles connect. That's it. That's pretty much the whole game. You're going to get one point for every match in color. Um, you're going to be able to figure this game out in seconds. It's really simple, but the more you play, the more you're going to figure out better strategies, the more experience you have. Now, the problem with this as a recommendation for experienced players versus new players is that the experienced gamer is probably going to win. They're probably going to trounce a new player, but this is such a quick, solid game that's very enjoyable to play and you feel like you're accomplishing something even if you lose, that I can almost guarantee that new player who just got beat is still going to have fun. They're going to learn something from that game and want to play again and play better next time. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, to clarify, this is ingenious, not ingenious, because someone doesn't type too well and I should not yeah. I should check my games before I actually try pronouncing them. Uh, <laughs> But, it's uh, felt right in the second spot. The second time it is, absolutely. Yes. Uh, <laughs> don't try find don't try and find Ingenious on Board Game Geek, but you can find Ingenious from 2004. This, yeah, this one's going back a little ways. Uh, so that's Ingenious. Ingenious. Next up we have Takanoko. All right, one of the best things about Takanoko is its theme and table presence. Uh, we were talking about how cute games draw people in or easy easy to accept. That, uh, games that look easy to easily accessible draw people in. People are just drawn to the little panda miniature and the little gardener miniature and the beautiful wooden bamboo in this game. The theme draws people in, and it's simple enough to learn mechanics. There's only, uh, I think, four different actions you're picking from. None of them are too complicated, but they lead to a surprisingly deep game that will bring players back. Uh, this is enough of a game that's simple enough. I play it with my daughter. But there's enough weight here in strategy and decisions, and you are a master of most of your own destiny in this game, except for the random draw of the um, goal cards. That this is a game I don't mind putting in board game tournaments because I think you can be like the the, the more strategic, more tactical player is tends to win without the random factors affecting it. So that's why I recommend this. One. Yeah, no, Attack and Oak was fun. I you know I, I played it for the first time uh, on on Board Game Geek a few weeks ago or Board Game Arena. Yeah. a few weeks ago uh and it's just an enjoyable game with uh, a lot of a lot of presence even the digital version uh while not quite as cute and adorable as the <laughs> yeah. uh, physical version is still definitely uh definitely fun so that was takanoko all right sometimes what you need when trying to get a new gamer hooked right when you're trying to get the new people interested is something with a theme to it uh, especially a theme that ties into something they already love. So our next two game suggestions do just that. They're games that I, I wouldn't say steeped in themes, but at least have themes that are going to draw people in based on their love of an existing property. Yeah. So first up, we have Lords of Waterdeep. Now, if you've got a fantasy fan, a Lord of the Rings fan at your table, or a D&D fan, more specifically, that's becoming more and more common, this is a Dungeons & Dragons board game, so they're probably going to love Lords of Waterdeep. Now, while the theme isn't overly heavily integrated into it, what you have here is a great intro-level worker placement game that's got plenty of depth to keep experienced gamers interested. Now, I will admit, they're, if they're huge fans of K-List, they're not going to think Lords of Waterdeep's the second coming. It's not that great a worker placement game, but there is enough depth there. Now, after you played once, if you can get the Skullport expansion, that's what you can throw in that tends to hook the experienced gamers. They'll get a little more involved in that because there's a risk-reward system added to that 
The person I think makes the game. I prefer to only ever play with Skullport. But if I'm playing with new players, I have no problem playing Lords of Waterdeep vanilla. Yeah, now I do tend I, I do I am the uh, the disagreeing party here. I don't necessarily agree that the theme is, is fantastic and wonderful and, and draws you in, but that was my experience with the game. Again, I still love the game. I just don't particularly saw, see the theme as as big of a draw. And again, that may have been how it was introduced. I don't know. Um, but that was Lords of Waterdeep. Now, next up, we have something that I'm a little more familiar with and I completely <laughs> agree with. Harry Potter, Hogwarts Battle. Yeah, this is another one with a theme. So if you're trying to hook a non-gamer, you got a Potterhead at your table, here's one to break out. Because Hogwarts Battle is a great intro-level deck-building game. It just teaches you the very basics of a somewhat random market, but not overly random market, and basic deck building. And it has the added bonus of being cooperative. And I probably should have more cooperative games on this list overall. I don't because I'm not a huge cooperative game fan myself, but they're always good when you have a group of mixed experience levels. Because this lets the experienced players use their experience to help the new players to work together. And in this case, defeat the forces of darkness and he who should not be named. I got to admit, I was really impressed by this great introduction to deck building. The only thing you got to watch for is watch for the difficulty to ramp up significantly at book five or so, and then like max out at book seven. So that is something to watch for. If you're going to keep playing through it, it does have a big difficulty spike. Yeah, no, absolutely. But those first four uh, books especially are really great, really introduction uh, friendly. And the nice thing about this game is it adds more components and, and techniques as you mm -hmm. move on. So the game learns with you. Now, again, unfortunately, there is that real difficulty spike, uh, which, again, we've talked about before. In a deck builder, it shouldn't be too easy to win. Um, so it starts off too easy to win, but it is definitely not too easy to win by the end. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, I taught this game to uh, one of your girls and a mm -hmm. few real gamers, you know, a few, few hardcore gamers sitting at uh, a table for your birthday, I think it was, or New Year's, or one of those. New Year's, New Year's. New Year's. Uh, and so, you know, we had this on the table with non-gamers and gamers, and mm -hmm. I taught it to my kids, and they got, and they jumped right into it, no problem whatsoever. So that was Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Uh, and then my addition to this list would be the DC Deck Builder. Again, a strong theme game, but go with the Teen Titans pack. Uh, and I know a lot of people have agreed with me on this one, and I've heard this from a number of people. Um, while there's nothing wrong with the, the base DC Deck Builder game, the Teen Titans pack has a few fun little sort of mechanics uh, within it that just makes it a more enjoyable game, I feel, especially for the new, easier, newer gamers. And as a deck builder, everything's right on your cards. All you need to do is learn out how to set up that basic uh, tableau of um, cards for the cards, and then everything else is on the cards from then on in. So it's really easy for everyone to pick up. Uh, and it's reasonably casual too. If you're, you know, if you're chatting away, all you have to do is turn and read what cards are up and you know what the situation is basically. Yeah, I haven't played that particular one myself. Um, I think I definitely wouldn't recommend Rivals. I think no. it's the one we played. Yeah, Rivals. Wow. Yeah, Rivals. Rivals I would <laughs> not recommend for the newer um, yeah, non-gamers. That, that was rough. Yeah, there's uh, there's some real technique to that and it helps if it helps if you know the uh, the games better. And that was DC Deck Builder Teen Titans. All right. We're checking back into the lobby now. We've uh, got a number of comments going on here. So uh, let's see. Uh, Ryan would like something a bit more than King Domino, but the Giants expansion isn't it. Yeah, I haven't checked out the Giants expansion. I got to say Queen Domino is good. I did notice he said something about it possibly not being accessible, so I'm yes. not sure. Yeah, so Queen Domino isn't, isn't uh, very accessible, and I definitely uh, agree on that one. Um, I think it's uh, it's got some issues because you can't, I mean, without being able to see clearly, you'd have to hack the cards. But I think it wouldn't be too hard to uh, put some braille marking of some sort um, onto those cards to be able to, to, to feel your, feel your like, way through what the dominoes are. Because again, it, they're, it's just dominoes. So Well, the problem with king, queen dominoes is not. There's also building tiles. And there's right. a whole bunch of different buildings that get overlaid on top. Right. So that's a bit of an issue. Right. I could see it. 
Uh, let's see. We have uh, Brian Counter Cult. Uh, Brian Counter Cult of the Old, uh, who is another blind game enthusiast. Enthusiast likes gizmos. I'd say I worry if like he, you mustn't be completely blind because those marbles you'd have to do something to. Like they are nice bright colors. Hmm. Like gizmos is good, but like there is no difference except color between those marbles. Right. And now Ryan's saying that uh, if he's involving color dice placement, he'd rather play role player over Sagrada. Um, I could see it, but I, I can't see that being a great intro. Yeah, I, I don't know. Again, team, if you've got D&D players, if you've got a bunch of people with, at your table and some are experienced, non-experienced gamers, and they know D&D specifically, or like roll three dice for strength, con, and so on, role player would work. I could definitely see that. No, I, I definitely agree that uh, it takes that it it does require that buy in on D and D in order for it to be easy enough to yeah. Um, but like, if you don't understand concepts like alignment and wearing different pieces of equipment and being able to equip only one handed weapon or a two handed weapon or two one handed weapons, it's those little concepts that I think are difficult for a new gamer. But nowadays, so many people have played RPGs, right? They played Skyrim. If they haven't played D and D, that it's it's becoming more accessible. Um, I personally, I don't know. Sagrada is just so nice and pure. Role player is neat, but I don't know. I haven't tried the role player expansion. I like role player, but for some reason, Sagrada gets to the table way more often. Yep. Uh, Danielle, who joined us uh, a little bit later, thank you for dropping in, uh, was mentioning that if it wasn't already said, concept was popular when we had non gamers at parties. See, the is that really that fun for gamers? That's the problem I have with concept. Like, I love concept. We've recommended it every time we talk about light games party games, casual game nights. But I was thinking, like, when I hear experienced gamer, I'm thinking, you know, people like GMT games, people like heavy games. And to be honest, concept, to me, isn't a gamer game at all. It's a social activity. So to me, that's the game you bring out when it's all like gamers. Or you bring out when it's a party. And yeah, the experienced gamers may play it and probably even have some fun with it. But I don't think there's anything in concept that really appeals to a heavy gamer or an experienced gamer anymore. Like, I... I code names when I, I as usual i do research before writing these things or before doing the show and i looked up a bunch of people's recommendations and code names was on everyone's list and i kind of get it because at least code names there's there's strategy involved like there's remembering where your opponents have picked and there's the tactics of the picking how many clues to give like i, I can see it i just personally again to me that's not something a heavy gamer is going to like but to me that's more of a gamer's game um, an interesting one is Pictomania that's from Vlada Shavatel and it's win, lose, or draw for gamers. And what it is, is that all of you are drawing at the same time and you're all trying to draw different things. And part of the strategy is while you're drawing, you have to look at what other people are drawing and you obviously know what you are, you're drawing out of the five clues. What are the other four people drawing? And you place bids on what you think they're drawing. It's really neat, but to be honest, it's so complicated that Every non gamer is going to be like, why aren't we just playing win, loser, draw, or Pictionary? <laughs> like, I don't want that every level of, I have to pay attention to what they're doing while I'm doing my thing. That's too much to think about. But, like, for me, there's a gamer's game that is, is could work. But that's why I didn't get on the list. I also didn't put any dexterity games. Like, I could have easily had Gokuku on this list, right? As a game. But, like, really, the experienced gamer is not getting anything out of it by being an experienced gamer in this case. Anyone could play that game. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's uh, yeah. When when you when you get into, um, I, I suppose the, the one argument I might have with that would be climbers. Uh, I think climber, yeah. climbers is one where you can That's get into one. it as, as a non gamer because it's not that difficult. The the, the basic concepts aren't that difficult, mm -hmm. but the gamer is going to be tearing their hair out trying to do all sorts of. Uh, no, I agree. Complex. That's a good call. That yeah. is a good call. Um. Uh, One was way earlier in the chat. Uh, Ryan again mentioned that an, another blind board game enthusiast has a mixed group of mostly non gamers where they compare every new game to Secret History or Resistance Avalon. They seem to love social deduction games. I, I've said it multiple times on the show. I don't like social deduction. I know it's a thing. I know people dig it. Yes, I guess, especially Resistance, there is strategy involved. It's not just lying to your friends, there's actually like there's deduction involved as long as there's actual deduction. Uh, another strongly recommended one, though I don't recommend it, is Sheriff of Nottingham for a game to play with non-gamers and gamers alike. But like I said, I personally am not going to put those on my recommendation list, but I'll definitely include them in the show notes because I know there's lots of people out there that love social deduction games, just not me. Yep. 
Well, and, it, and to be honest, it's the same as games like Cards Against. I mean, you know, a lot yeah. of people like it. Uh, we just find that there's a lot of better options out there that you could be playing. <laughs> yeah, like I said, for social deductions, your your Resistance Avalon's the ones I like, right? Battlestar Galactica is a fantastic social deduction game, but it takes three hours to play, and I'd never recommend it for a new player. Um, there are in between games, right? There was oh, I can't even remember the name of the the one where you're on Mars. It was a Battlestar Galactica light Homeland, maybe if people dig it. Um, I haven't played Slew, so I don't know that. Uh, Ryan is asking Merchant of Venus. Personally, I think there's way too much going on in Merchant of Venus for a new player. Now, that's a good one if you've got players who are okay with, say, Carcassonne, not Carcassonne, like Catan. Like it, it, it's almost a good next step. If you played Kark, you played Catan, maybe even got them to play Power Grid. Merchant of Venus can be in that mix, but for a brand new gamer, I think it's overwhelming. All right. Well, that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. Uh, if you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We need new questions. 